Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that our sister Tony is with us tonight. Mm -hmm. We just pray for all of us as we continue, Father, through this Jacob's time of trouble. That we would be able to take hold of your strength, Father. For all of us have been bearing much trials and many burdens, and yet you say your burden is light. So, Father, help us to give these burdens over to you that we may do the work and, and go through the trials with great peace. We are so thankful, Father, for the blessing and the privilege to be a part of this. But we seek your strength and we seek your grace every day, Father, to help us to go through this. And we pray, Father, to be blessed that we might be a blessing to others. And as our sister Tony leads out in this study, we just pray, Father, for you to give her um, clarity of mind and, uh, and help her, Father, to present the things that she has learned from it as well. And we might all together have great discussion on this topic of the sin problem, Father. So may your Holy Spirit be with us and lead us, teach us, and prepare us, Lord, for the great work that is to come. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You got one of those in front of the camera, too. No. Every now and then. <laughs> Wait, they're going to fight. Hold on. Oh. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm supposed to share. <laughs> oh. Okay. You can uh, um, I'm trying to get my picture out of there. Did you go to the bottom and do... Um, I have mute. Stop it. I do it. Um, it says start me. I have the camera. Did it go away? Because I have the camera with the line through it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if your camera's with the line through it, it should be fine. Oh, see, on this one, though, I can't scroll. No, you can't. I do. Oh, okay. All right. Unless you share it. If I'm sharing it, then I scroll it. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to do a, a, a presentation from um, Terry Lambert called uh, The Sin Problem. All right. So I want to share... What I, no, what I want to share is something that I first heard uh, Elder Parminder share in 2017 and at the Prophecy School in Arkansas. And then he continued to share it in Guadalupe in 2019. So before we go there, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 32, 33. Um, they're familiar verses to those um, that have been in the message for a while as it gives us important principles on how to understand the Bible. So 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 30, 32 to 33. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of, of the saints. So the important principle that we get from these verses is that all prophets agree with one another. They might be saying something different. They might be expressing different symbols, different stories, but they all agree. Daniel agrees with John the Revelator, who agrees with Joel, who agrees with Paul, who agrees with Christ. They all agree. They all agree with the spirit of prophecy and vice versa. So all the spirits agree with one another because God is not the author of confusion. So if God's not the author of confusion, who is the author of confusion? Satan is the author of confusion. And what word in the Bible do we associate with confusion? We associate it with Babylon. So we go back to Genesis. We see that God confounded their language. And there was confusion because many people were speaking different languages and nobody understood each other. So Satan is the author, uh, is the author of that. He is the author of confusion. And what is our understanding of Babylon at the end of the world? So if we went to Revelation 16, it's a threefold union of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. 
Babylon is divided into three parts. Satan, confusion, Babylon equals beast equals false prophet. So let's go back. If God is not the author of confusion, what is God the author of? What did our verse tell us? Peace. God is the author of peace. And what's the word in the Bible we associate with peace? And she said, compare and contrast, and it's Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem that shall prosper that love. The, the peace be within thy walls and thy palaces. It's the city of peace, Jerusalem, divided into three parts. So it's God, peace, and Jerusalem. Yes, we would say that the dragon and the beast and the false prophet are a counterfeit of what? A counterfeit of the heavenly trio. The three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What I also want us to notice is that within that threefold union of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we also see a fractal because Jerusalem is or can be divided. Or I should say, Jesus' role in the plan of salvation can be divided into three parts. What does the dragon represent? If we looked at these three entities, what does the dragon represent as opposed to the beast and the false prophet? Represent state power. And we would call state power what? King. And the beast, church. And the false prophet? We'll leave that just for a moment. So Jerusalem is divided into three. As Jesus, has Jesus got a role as a king? Yes, he does. And what do you have that is associated with having a church? So who works for the church? That would be the priests. And what is another role that Jesus takes on? Prophet. So Jesus, he's prophet, he's priest, and he's king. And while he is all those things, they are not necessarily roles he takes on at the same time. When Christ came to the earth for the first time, who were the people expecting? Who were they waiting to arrive? They wanted a king. And what did they get? They got a prophet. Scroll, scroll. I think so. Um, did you go too much? Okay. Okay. And what did God's people do with the prophets? They killed them. So they didn't want a prophet. They got a king. So that's the first advent. The second advent is in the Millerites time period. And what were, and what were the people expecting? And what were the people there then expecting? They are waiting for the king. And what did they get? They got a priest. Did they want a priest? The message in 1844 was all about Christ's heavenly ministry. And that's not what suited the majority of the people. And the movement went from 50,000 to 50, as we know, overnight. And they were waiting for a king. So here we are at Ventus. We are Ventus waiting for the king. To understand the king and to be, be prepared for the king, we have to accept Christ's other roles as prophet and as priest. The prophet gives us the message and the priest is here to help us with our experience. We bring them both together in preparation for the king. So we want to have more of a look at that today. The prophet brings us messages, the prophecies that we need to have. We must combine the message that the prophet is given with the experience that the priest is given us. We know that Samuel was a prophet, priest, and what? Samuel was a prophet, priest, and judge. And then the king comes. What is he coming to do? He's coming to execute ju judgment. So it is possible to have all those roles at the same time. Samuel was a type of Christ, prophet, priest, judge. He was not king. They chose a king because they just had a king. Because if they just had a king, they could ditch the prophet and the priest, or at least put them in a lesser role. 
uplift the king, let's keep the prophet and the priest in a box. We must bring them all together. So to understand the role of the priest, let us go to Daniel chapter eight. This is Daniel's second vision. So it is our third line of prophecy. The first dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel had a dream in Daniel 7. This is the second dream or vision in Daniel 8. And it's just a repeat and enlarge of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, the rise and fall of kingdoms. But it is given from a different perspective. We have looked at this before. What we are going to see is counterfeit sanctuary language. In verse 3 and 4, we see a ram. That ram represents Medo-Persia. A ram is a sacrificial animal, but what is wrong with this sacrificial animal? It's got one horn higher than the other. It's not quite right ram. It was imperfect. It was blemished, and you cannot bring blemished offerings to the sanctuary. This ram is not quite right. He is representing a counterfeit religion. And his problem is in verse four, but he does according to his will. He does whatever he wants to do and he lifts himself up. He becomes great. He magnifies himself. We call that self exaltation. Hebrew, the word meaning gadol. I know that's spelled wrong. <laughs> anyway, so that's the ram's problem not fit for purpose, not fit for our purpose, fit for Satan's purpose. So then we go to the next animal in verse five, and it's a goat. Again, not quite right goat. It has a horn between his eyes. Goats don't have horns between their eyes. And then you go to the top of the horn, and then, and then on the top of that horn gets broken. So it's a double whammy. It's not a good goat. So he lifts himself up and magnifies himself as well. And then our next kingdom is represented as what? We've got a ram and then a he goat. And then we have, what's our symbol? It, it is an animal. It is a sacrificial, um, let me see. Is it a sacrificial animal? No, but it's connected to the sanctuary. In what way is it connected to the sanctuary? What is it represented by? A little horn is represented by a horn. Now, where do we see horns in the sanctuary? They're on this particular furniture. So the altars have horns. You would bring it to your sacrifice. You would bring in your sacrificial animal and you would tie it to the horns of the altar. It was being tied to its purpose. And we see that if you go back to Psalms 18, 27, God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even onto the altar, the horn of the altar. These are counterfeit horns. These sacrifices have been brought to a brought and tied to. And what's the purpose? So that animal would be sacrificed and the life of that animal is in the blood. The blood would be the transfer into the sanctuary via the horn. So both the blood and the ram and the blood of the he goat all gets laid on this little horn. It is a little horn because it's on the altar of the sanctuary. So go back to Daniel eight. The life of those animals is transferred to the horn. And then they're given quite a bit of information about that horn from verse nine to 12. There's an oscillation. There's a repeat and enlarge. We'll go over it quickly for those who aren't familiar in verse nine. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. Out of one of what? Where did the little horn come out from? It comes from the winds. It doesn't come from the four broken horns of Greece and Rome of Greece. Rome didn't come from Greece. It came from the West Wind. Because, uh, um, okay. because those horns were divided between the North, South, East and West, the winds and 
the um, in west, the winds and Rome came from the west. It was just wester than Greece. So Rome comes from the west wind and it's waxed exceedingly great. It lifts itself up even greater than the Medes and the Persians and the Grecians, and it magnifies itself. So a quick way to understand the little horn is in verse nine. It's him, which is masculine. And when it's masculine, it's pagan Rome. Verse 10, it could be also translated as she. It's feminine, it's papal Rome. And then what's it going, and then what's going to happen is that it's going to be repeated. And verse 11 would be him, masculine. 12, it is feminine. And there's a diagram for verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, him, masculine, pagan Rome. Her, feminine, in, in verse 10, is papal Rome. 11, him, 12, it, feminine. We are not going to go into details of that verse. I just want to bring out that you can divide the little horn into two phases, but it is still one horn. It is one horn, with two phases. And what does this horn do? Verse 12, and it casts down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. So where we want to go is verse 13 and 14. Verse 13, then I heard one saint speaking to the another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So there's a question being asked, how long? How long are two desolating powers going to tread down two things? The desolating powers are going to tread down two things, the host and the sanctuary. So one of those desolating powers is called the daily, and the other desolating power is called the transgre transgression of desolation. Let's go over to verse 20 and 21. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the two are the kings of Media and Persia. You can't get any easier than that. It's it's set out clearly, meet Ram and Media Persia. So verse 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grisha, and the great horn that is between the eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great, first Media Persia, then Greece. Okay. Now we're going to get into more information about the little horn. Verse 22 is going to tell us the breakup of the big horn of Greece, that the four kingdoms arrive. But verse 23 says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, the latter time of the kingdom, the breakup of the four horns of Greece. In the latter time, when the transgressions are to the who are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So at the end of Greece, when the transgressors have come to their full, there is going to be this king of fierce countenance. This king of fierce countenance is the little horn, both phases. Who are the transgressors? Because some transgressors, they're going to come to their full. And then this king of fierce countenance will stand up. Who are these uh, transgressors, transgressors? And what is transgression? Transgression is sin. And sin is breaking the law. So the lawbreakers, who are the lawbreakers? Who are these transgressors that is referred in this verse. I'd like to suggest that they're not Greece and they're not Medo-Persia. They are God's people. We're coming to a time when God's people are, full, are filling up the cup of their own transgressions. And at the same time is when the little horn is going to rise to power. In that latter time of their kingdom, 
That is when the king of the north and the king of the south is fighting it out. Then Rome steps on the scene. The transgressors have come to the full. They are coming down to the end of ancient Israel. It is at the end of ancient Israel that you see Rome rise to power. You are, uh, they are the kingdom that understand dark sentences. They speak a language that is not understood before. Medes and Persians, Medes and Persians, Greece is God's people. They're all Semitic, I don't know that word, Semitic, okay, language. There is a part of similarity quite different to what comes out of Italy. So verse 24, and this power shall be mighty, but not only by its own power, he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy who? The mighty and the holy people. Did pagan Rome destroy the mighty and the holy people? Yes. There were two des des destructions of Jerusalem in 63 BC and in 70 AD. And these prefigure the destruction of Jerusalem at the end of the world. They practiced and prospered and destroyed the mighty and holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he magnified himself in his heart. And by peace, they shall destroy many. And did they destroy people? Not just by warfare and not just by physical persecution, but by peace. And it shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So just as in verse 9 to 12, you see both phases of Rome there. You see both phases in verse 23 to 25, but there's a mingling because these characteristics that belong to both pagan and papal Rome, they both cause craft to prosper, they both magnify themselves in the heart, and they both destroy many by peace, and they both rise to power to destroy the transgressors. So let's go back to verse 13 and see where God's people come into this. Verse 13, the question is asked, how long? How long are these two desolating powers going to tread down? Now, how do you tread something down? You can tread it physically, um, persecution. You can stamp something into the ground. What is another use of feet? Let us go to Isaiah 52, seven. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish what? That publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Your God, thy God is king. So what do feet do? Feet bring tidings. Now feet that bring good tidings are beautiful feet. And people that, and, and beautiful feet that bring good tidings, they publish peace. So tidings of peace. So let's go at the counterfeit of that. Are all feet beautiful? Obviously not, because there are two desolating powers in Daniel 8 that are going to tread something down. You tread something down with your feet. So there's obviously got to be some ugly feet that bring bad tidings to that publish confusion, um, that do not publish salvation, but publish damnation. So there is a gospel of salvation and there is a gospel of damnation. There are good messengers of peace and there are bad messages of, of confusion. So there is two ways that Rome can tread down God's people. Physically, yes. They tried to do that very well during the 1260 years of paganism and the 1260 years of papalism, but also through messages because you do it with your feet and feet bring messages. So let's go back to Daniel 8. 
How long shall these two desolating powers tread down two things? Sister White says the scriptures, which all others was about the foundation and central pillar of Adventism is the is this verse, Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed or made right or justified. So what's the problem? The problem is there is a question that's, that's being asked. How long are two things going to be trodden down by two things? And the answer is about one thing. It's about the sanctuary. The host and the sanctuary get trotted down, and the answer is only about the sanctuary. So we know we can go to another prophecy. We'll line that up now, but we won't go into it with great detail. We'll go to the 2520 time prophecy. 742 BC, there's a prophecy that comes that says the northern kingdom is going to be taken away. It's going to be wiped out off of, like off a plate. And what happens? 19 years later in 723 BC, the northern kingdom is taken captive and God's people go into captivity 1,260 years. To what? The daily paganism, and then the 1260 years to papalism, the transgression of desolation. And that takes us to um, 1798. There it goes. Thank you. Paganism, the counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary. Papalism, the counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. This is all about Christ's ministry and God's plan of salvation. Then we know that the Southern Kingdom went into captivity in 677 BC, and that brings us to 1844, October 22nd. Okay. So 46 years between there. So what happens in 1798? In 1798, the host stops being trodden down. The beast was received a, dead, a deadly wound. It is no longer a persecuting power. That woman needs a beast to do the trotting down for her. So the kings have turned on the woman. Also, the people have turned on the kings. So there's no more corrupt kings and no and corrupt women that are able to tread down these people in 1798. They've moved from the old world to the new world. A lot of dynamics have happened to create that special circumstance in 1798, whereby God can raise another host or army. Then in October 22nd, 1844, answers the question of the sanctuary. You cannot have a sanctuary without a host, and you cannot have a host without a sanctuary. Really, they are just another term or parable for a king and a kingdom. So a king must have a kingdom. He has to have a people. He has to have a kingdom. So it's a different parable, but it is what every parable is going to give you, a different aspect of the same story. And when we see the host in the sanctuary, what is it trying to teach us? What has sin done to God's people? And who are God's people in 1798? We stopped being trodden down here. Protestants. So they are all God's people. It so are they all God's people? It depends. What God is going to do, he's going to send a test. He will send a three angels message. Those three, three angels message are going to divide the people between the real deal and the pretenders, between those that say they are God's people and those that are just pretending. So it divides two classes of people based on a testing prophetic message. So the hosts aren't necessarily all that they say they are. And they have to be tested and divided. And that brings us to 1844. So that is the history 
of that first part of the Millerite history. So this is the church of Sardis that have a name, that are alive, but they are dead because they got a name, because they got a name that says they are Protestants, but they are not protesting. So God has to send them another test. So the, sanctu so the sanctuary, sin has done what? It, has sep it separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. And so why did God have the sanctuary built? He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So somehow the san that sanctuary must solve the sin problem because God can now dwell among his people. God separates the sanctuary. God separates the sanctuary, brings God and the people back together again. So he must solve the sin problem. First, he's got to raise up a people, and then he can he can begin to show them how he is going to solve the sin problem. What gathered the people in this time period? A perfect a prophetic message. And now we can open, and now he can open to them how the plan of salvation works. So this is the work of the prophet. And now God is going to open to them the work of the priest. So Daniel 8.14 brings us to this date here. So this is the Millerite history. So it's got to be 1844, or is it 1843? 1843, based on the chiasm of the 2520. Thank you. Scroll. 1863. Is that what 63? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, what was meant to happen in 1863? The king was meant to come, but we know that that was a history of failure and the king did not come. So, what went wrong? What went wrong was the king did not come in 1863. So we are going to look at that history. We're going to read a portion from early writings 55. This is the chapter on um, the end of the 20, 2300 days. The first paragraph is talking about what Sister White sees in vision. She sees the father and the son sitting on the throne, but she's going to see the father move. Well, yeah. Um, the father's, uh, the father's face, she cannot see, but she is going to see that his presence moves into the most holy. Both the father and the son are shedding light on God's people, on waiting companies. The Advent people are receiving light. A lot of people are bowing down. They are deeply interested, while others are not that interested. Some are careless. Early writings, 55.156. I saw the father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the holy of holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most, and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitudes after he arose and they were left in perfect darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them away out, out a little way. He, uh, then he raised his right arm and was heard his lovely voice saying, wait here, I'm going to my father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless. And in a little while, I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire, surrounded by angels, came to where, came to where stand, came to where, I don't know, came to where Jesus was. He um, stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the father sat. There I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would send their faith to him in the holiest and pray, My Father, give us thy spirit. 
Then Jesus would breathe upon them in the Holy Ghost. In the, and Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. And that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. So Jesus moves from the holy place to the most holy. There we go. God's people are sitting before the throne. And what are they expected to do? It's a movement. It's, it began as a movement. It's going to end as a movement. You must follow Jesus. And they moved with him into the most holy place. Did everybody move? No, some stayed. They did not want to move. Those that moved with Jesus, what did Jesus say to them? They moved with him post October 22nd, 1844. And Jesus says to his faithful followers, Terry. Where do we get that word Terry? From the parable of the 10 versions. So those that followed successfully during these testing times are wise versions. They are followed, they are followed through, and Jesus says to them, Terry. What else does he say to them? Keep your garments spotless. Whose garments were to whose garments were they to keep spotless? Their own garments. Jesus says, keep your garments spotless. Then he says he would return. He would return to take them in from the wedding. So we know he was to return in 1863. But before 1863, what are the people to cry out? We are to cry out, behold, the bridegroom cometh. So they are to give a message down here, 1863. Um, that um, that will herald the coming of the king. They are going to say, behold, the bridegroom cometh. So until they get that message, which we would call the Sunday law message, they have to keep their garments clean and it's their garments. So when it is, so when, so when is it that their garments are clean? Having clean garments indicates that they are righteous, that they have righteousness. So I'd like to um, give a little object lesson. So this is um, Sister Terry, and she's going to give us an object lesson. This is a brown Borina, Borina megastema. Borinas are a species that has about 160 different varieties. They are native of Western Australia. They have a smell that's heavenly. That's why sometimes they call it, a he they, they're called a heavenly scent. You can't describe it. You know lavenders, lavender roses, roses, etc. This is hard to describe. Perfumes the aroma. It's gorgeous. The problem is it's notorious for dying. Very hard to keep. This was a gift from my mother. My mom gave me this. My mom has this theory. If you, if you call it a theory, she says, just buy a Verona every year. Enjoy it for the whole season. Then it dies Get some and get another one the next year. She says it's a cheap bunch of cut flowers. If you were to go and buy cut flowers, it would cost four or five times as much as this only lasts um, a matter of weeks. Whereas this you got for the whole season. Then you buy another one the next year. Well, what kind of, well, that kind of challenged me because I thought I'd like to keep this alive. So how do I keep it alive? Google. You look up what you do, what you look up what to do, and you find out all sorts of things about this plant. It doesn't like its roots drying out, but it doesn't like to be overlogged either. There are certain feeds you've got to give it. Double, double light. I have to I have to tend to this plant daily. It's beautiful. It's heavenly. It's called heavenly scent. Now those Barona. Now whose Barona is this? This is my Barona. It's my mother. She gave it to me. Can you see? It's still a very 
boring block pot. So she's holding up a pot. So that's what she's saying. That's because I'm not going to transplant it yet. It will go into a really nice pot once it stops flowering. I would, stre I would stress it and we would um, lose the scent. So I'm going to wait till it stops flowering and then I will transplant it. I'll glorify it and put it in a really nice pot. And then I'm going to have, and then I'm going to have to be careful and tend to it every day. Now, my mom, she, she's not God, but God gives us something. He gives us a gift. And when he gives us, gives that to us, whose is it? Well, it's ours. Now, can my mom help me look after this plant? Of course, of course she can. I can ring her up. I can ask for advice. We could work together to keep this plant alive. It's going to take a fair bit of effort on my part. I've got, I've, I've got to will to keep it alive. I could just happily keep it a year and then start again. Lots of starting again every year. So this is how righteousness works. We come to God with our filthy rags, with our sins, and Christ in his mercy, he takes off our filthy garments and he gives us his unsullied, unsullied, unspotted, uncorrupted robe of righteousness. So when did he do that? He did that in 1844. They passed over the test successfully. They died as they were in the great disappointment. They were grief stricken they went into the grave. The faithful rose out of that grave. They received the righteousness of Christ. They had gone through it successfully. And God says to them, keep your garments spotless. He gives them those garments. He does not ask you to do something that is not in your power to do. And yet he will be there to help you with that. In 1844, they are given garments. They're giving they're going to keep them spotless. Then they're going to give a message to announce the coming of the king. So let us take that history of the Millerites. We'll go to 1798 to 1844. And we're going to turn it into the history of the 144,000. So we go to the book of the Great Controversy and we find another way mark. We know it's going to end um, in a second advent, but what are the two preceding? What, but what are the two preceding way marks? The Sunday law and the close of probation. Thank you. So right here in 1844, if we overlay this with an agricultural model, what have we got on this line? We have a plowing. The seed is sown. Because all the thorns have been dug up, we have the early rain, latter rain, and the harvest. So here we die the death of the seed. We rise in the newness of life. Simply different words for the same experience. We call this baptism. This is where Christ takes our old garments, gives us his new. It's ours. And Christ says, Keep your garments spotless. Revelation chapter 19. This is the marriage of the lamb. This is the king coming back to get his subjects. Verse seven. Um, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of who? The righteousness of the saints. The fine linen is not the righteousness of who? Christ. Why do we say that? Why do I say that plant is mine and not my mother's? It's originated by my mom but she gave it to me, the plant, and it is mine. It is mine to keep. Here's a group of people that were giving Christ righteousness. 
Now it's there to keep unspotted and it's clean, fine linen. She has made herself ready. It is never God's intention if we lay this experience out in our own life and call this baptism. It is never God's intention that we sin after we are baptized. We enter a new kingdom. We are spiritually reborn. In 1844. So before that time, we call that the sins of our youth. In the agricultural model, it is the plowing up of the thorns. So not among the thorns. Get rid of the thorns. What we do when we come to baptism is we deal with the sin of our youth, our youth being everything before we were baptized. All the things we did when we didn't know any better or we didn't care or we didn't think it mattered. We come to the cross. We are reborn. We see ourselves who we are. And what Christ does is he cleanses us from the sins of our youth. So that's the time period from 1798 to 1844 during the plowing. They are forgiven and they are cast into the depths of the sea. In the sanctuary, they are washed in the leva, which was a sea. So the sins of our youth have been dealt with by Christ. And then he says, he that is dead is free from sin, Romans 6, 7. So here we are to be free from sin. The reality is that we fall into sin. So just keep scrolling. <clears throat> Some say, well, nobody ever told me that I was not meant to sin after I was baptized, which is kind of a part excuse because I think we all know that we are not meant to do bad things but when you don't understand the plan of salvation it's easy to fall into that so after baptism if we sin first John tells us that we have an advocate with the father <clears throat> so do not sin first John verse 7 but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all righteousness. Cleanses from all sin. Thanks. <clears throat> so now we have to walk in the light. What, what is it before here? If we have darkness, we are going to start walking in the light. And then we come to a point where the blood of Christ is going to cleanse us from all sins. What sins? The sins of our youth. The sins of when we were walking in darkness, when we had these thorns. We have a period where we are to get the thorns out of our life, to get your life right. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not with is not in us. And what point do we place this here? We place it in 1844. There you go. The cross and baptism, 1844. If you say you have no sin, you are deceived. But if we confess our sin, which is right here, 1844, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he does that here at the cross, 1844, and baptism. So this is talking about sins prior to conversion. Because when John will go on to say in chapter 2, my little children, these things write I on to you, that you what? Sin not. So now, sin not here. You say you have no sin. So if you say you have no sin, you are a liar. The truth is not in you. But after you have confessed and you've been cleansed, you are to sin not. But he says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So do we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness? 
and he is the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And whereby we know that, and whereby we do know that we know him, if we do what? If we keep his commandments. So sinning not means keeping his commandments. So here we have our new garments. Keep it spotless, which keeps, which means keep the commandments. But we know that when we come to October 22nd, 1844, what period have we entered as far as the sanctuary motif is concerned? We are in the Day of Atonement. So all our sins are laid on Jesus. So all our sins are laid on Jesus. What sins? These sins. So these sins, he carries them. He bears them. He is our sin bearer. And he took all our sins to the cross. But what happens to those sins? Does he bear those? Does Christ die more than once? We do not crucify Christ afresh. He dies once. So he died for those sins. So who has to bear the sins of our post-life? This is the work of a scapegoat. And what is a scapegoat? A scapegoat is somebody who gets blamed for something he did not do. Does Satan commit our sins? No. But the sins that we do after our conversion are placed on the scapegoat. The message is still the same to us, though. At this point, we are to sin not. It is not an excuse to sin. All the sanctuary is teaching us is this instance is how God is going to deal with these those sins. What I would like to follow up on is how come we how come we can get here to the cross, 1844 and baptism in our line and understand that this is why the plan of salvation works. So because there are those that say that we teach heresy in saying that Satan is a sin bearer, there are two goats, one goat for the offering of the people. The other was the scapegoat goat. Both bore sins. So what we want to do is take this line of the 144,000 and we are going to write the fractal of the priest underneath. We are going to go into 1989. The second advent, what date do we give for that line of the priest? So we call this 144,000. This is the line of the priest. This is 2021 close of probation, 2019, Sunday law, 2014, which means what? It lines up with 1844. In the line of the 144,911, this was our plowing time. This was when we were to be born again. And this is when we are to keep our garments spotless. And then there you have all that right there. So, okay. Right. Thank you. And then God will send us rain. Some, some at point, we are going to make the announcement that the bridegroom cometh. That's the, min, that's the midnight cry message. So if we were to overlay this message, these lines with the lines of Christ, we know that Jesus came and was speaking to the people. That is that his messages came across as new. Sister White, where am I? Sister White says they thought they were strange, and yet he was doing, and and yet all he was doing was opening the truths that had been lost somehow. The old truths had been covered up with tradition and superstition of men. So. I'll tell you what is interesting thing to do, to go to the Ellen White CD-ROM and click on the book Desire of Ages and just type in the word new. And you'll see that there was just so many things that appeared new to the people because they had been in darkness for so long. 
And yet she says repeatedly, it was not new. What he was doing was bringing old truths back to life. So it's just, so it just seemed like something odd and something strange. So what we share is simply basic Adventism that has been lost over the years. We want to look at why it has been lost. Why do people struggle with some of these teachings? So if we go here to 1863, this was the line of failure. It is a reform line. So what is God going, so what is God, God doing with the reform line? All he is doing is he is all he is doing is it is a period of history where he is trying to reform his people and get them ready for his coming. It is to let us know that it is time to get our lives in order. So we come down to our history beginning in 1989. And we know that from 1863 to 1989, it is how long? It is 120 years, 126 years, um, 126 what? It is a remnant. It is a fraction of the 1260. God's people were trodden down of paganism and papalism for 1260 years, trodden down not only physically, but trodden down spiritually through messages. So in this time period, this 126 years, God's people go into captivity. They go into captivity to both paganism and papalism. And they begin to be trodden down with the wrong messages. It is something that progresses through the generations. It starts off slow. And then towards the end, of the end God's got to start reforming his people again. So this, is a, so this is a study that has been done many times. Let us go to the book of Joel, chapter one. The, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your father? So what is the first thing we are going to do to get an understanding of this book. We have to place it in content. So where is Joel? We can go to the passage, the great controversy that places, that places us just nicely where Joel is in history. He is right here, 720. And the question is being asked, have you ever seen anything like this happen before? Anything like what? Anything like 10 12th of a nation being swept away, totally taken out of their land. So Joel is asking the question, have you ever seen anything like this before? Nothing like this has ever happened in history. And he is talking to this old man and all the inhabitants of the land. He is the old man of the leadership. The inhabitants of the land are the rest of them. Have you ever known to have you ever known this to happen before? So verse three, tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. And in this verse, we count four generations. So there is you, tell your children, tell your children. Uh, your children tell your children and their children tell another generation four generations and then he describes this in a parable language the destructive influence of four insects um, that which the palmer worm hath left at the locust eaten and that which the locust hath left the count canker worm eaten and that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillar eaten after four successes successive generations by the time you get to the end of the fourth generation there's nothing left what has been eaten what has been eating this plant it's actually not a plant it's a fig tree if if we read on verse seven he hath laid my vines waste and hath barked my fig tree so what happened to this fig tree 
it gets ring bark and the sap of the root cannot pass up the branch of this fig tree, the root being Christ. So the nourishment, the goodness, the moisture is not able to get into the branches of the fig tree. What has happened? We go back to verse five and six. Awake drunkards and, and weep. And how are you drunk? Drink, drinkers of wine, because the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek, teeth of a great lion. So the message to the people is awake, you are drunk, and something has made them drunk. That drink is wine. And what is wine? It's doctrine, it's the message. The nation that is coming up that has got teeth like the teeth of a lion is who? This is Babylon. So Babylon is going to rise and it's going to bring judgment on God's people. They have four generations, there is nothing left. Now God is going to use Babylon. We say that Babylon is a threefold entity. We understand that the prophecy of Daniel 2 is the story of Babylon because the head is literal Babylon. If God illustrates the end from the beginning, what is the bottom of the statue? It must be spiritual Babylon. And spiritual Babylon is invited, it divided into three parts. But we also know that the bottom of the statue is iron and it is Rome. So Rome at the end of the world is also spiritual Babylon. So when we've got Babylon coming against God's people, it prefigures Babylon. Spiritual Babylon coming at the end of the world, and yet it's also Rome. So we have to bring the two kingdoms together. Modern Rome is also part of spiritual Babylon. So what are we looking at? Is that Joel standing and he's saying, have you ever seen anything like the 23, like the 723 happened before? And he is going to prophecy of what? And he is going to prophesy of what's going to happen in 677. For, destruct, for destructive insects that are going to take away everything and God's people are going to be trodden down of paganism and papalism in the, 12, in the 1260 years. So when we see 126, what do we know is going to happen between 1863 and, and 1989? God's people are going to be trotted down until he can free his hopes just like the host was supposed to stop being trodden down in 1798. In 1989, the host has to stop being trodden down. So during those years, you can mark them out as four generations. The first generation would take us through to 1888. That is when the spirit of prophecy was started to be rejected. And the people were bringing in philosophical ideas of the Bible and the pioneers of the pioneers never had. And then in the next generation from 1888 onwards to 1919, you see that the whole ex, um, explo explosion of the um, con contention over the daily and the fundamental beliefs that belong to Daniel chapter eight and others that we see the war on the daily. So 1919 to 1956, we see God's people head back to um, Protestantism. The church's best and brightest are sent off to theological seminaries to become educated. They bring the Protestant doctrines and then the books of a new order are written between 1919 and the 1950s. And then by the time you get to 1956 and onwards, there really isn't much left. So on that note, we are going to back, we're going to go back to a quote that we looked at from early writings. 
And again, she's talking about the 1844 time. And she says, I turned to look at the company who was still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them, upon them an unholy influence, and there was and there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's objects was to object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. So those people that did not follow through the test of 18 of October 22nd, 1844, are left praying before the holy place, and Satan is breathing onto them an unholy influence. So those that did not pass into the most most holy place, they are being breathed upon a uh, holy influence. Satan has a plan. These people are deceived. I think that's supposed to be unholy, upon uh, unholy. Um, these people are deceived. So what does so what does he want to do? He wants to keep them deceived. So those that have rejected the message, they are deceived. He must keep them deceived. And it says to draw back. Draw back where? So they are in the most holy. Where does he have to draw them back to? This becomes apostate protestantism. Apostate protestantism, if they draw back, where do they end up? They end up back in papalism. And we know that because what they're going to do is they're going to make an image to the beast. That might not change their name, they might not change out, they may not outwardly change the name of their religion, but they have drawn back into Catholicism. So he keeps them deceived and he draws them back. And then what else is Satan's object? It's to deceive God's people. So those who have passed through, now he wants to deceive them. And how does he deceive them? by bringing them into a Laodicea condition. Once they're in a Laodicea condition, then those four destructive incidents will do their work. Over a period of four generations, you have nothing left. And when you come to 18, 1989, God must start again to free his people from the captivity of paganism and papalism spiritual paganism and spiritual papalism. This period here in 1956 onwards, and you could argue a bit earlier about 1956 onward, it's war. There's war in the church and the war is between conservatives and liberals. Who are the conservatives in the church in the 1850s and onward? We can name them. You can name Spears and Sandishes. And let me see. You can name, you can name the Spears and I guess those are people, the Spears and the Sardishes and all that. And within the conservatives of that period, you have got many variations in a it, it is a quite spectrum ultra conservatives and then those that are less so, but certainly there are two sides. As a result of those conservatives, another group comes out and they are what we call liberal theology. So I'm going to give them two names. There's new theology and the new theology is being fought against by the last generation theology. New theology are liberals. Now, when we think of liberals in this time period, who comes to mind? When you think about the American government at this moment, and we talk about right and left, we know that in both sides, there are extremes. So we would call this the left. So the new theology are liberals and left. Scroll, thank you. And who is the extreme left? Men like Robert 
Brinsmead and Desmond Ford. So you have men on the far left that say no sanctuary, no high priestly ministry. Everything is done on the cross. Everything is done for you. Then you have men that are not so left as that, but that's your 1888 message study committee. Men like Jack Sekira, Wheeland, in short, not as left as that. It is much more subtle, but what they are talking about is universal legal justification. And they spread this message of universal legal justification that at the cross, Jesus died for everybody. Everybody was justified. Um, we, have we have never taught that. We believe in vicarious atonement. Vicarious atonement is a one-on-one. -on -one. You accept Christ as your personal savior. Then he imputes his righteousness to you. He justifies you. So there is this war the last generation theology is your conservatives. We would call them the right. Uh, this is the same dynamic that was in the time of Christ. When we read the gospels, who was Jesus mostly sparring with? The Pharisees. That is what you see in the, that is what you see in the gospels. But when you go to the letter of John and even the book of Revelation, it is not the Pharisees that are the problem. It is the Nicolonians. It is the Gnostics. It is the Antoninism. Uh, so over here, you see Antoninism. I can't say that. And what that means basically is no law. So a new theology, it's liberals left and no law. On the last generation theology, conservatives, and they're the right. Agnostics are a first generation phenomenon that grew out of the first century, both from Jewish churches and Christian churches. And they had liberal beliefs, so no law. So let's go to Revelation chapter two, verse six. One of the characteristics of Ephesus, it says, but this thou hast, that thou hast the deeds of the Nicolonians, which I also hate. What does God hate? God hates what? God, okay. Um, what does God hate? God hates what the Nicolonians do. He doesn't hate the Nicolonians, but he hates their deeds. Because the Nicolonians were early agnostic set that, that believed that the works of the flesh had nothing to do with the condition of the spirit. Basically, no law. They were antinomians. And so they lived their life whatever way they wanted to live. They were not restricted to by law. And God said, I hate their deeds. Then when you go to the church of per per Permagus, which is the church of compromise, Verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So in a compromise, what are they allowing? They are allowing liberals to come into the church and live however they want to live. And then by the time you get to the fourth church, you have Jezebel teaching and seducing God's people. So even within these four churches, you see progressiveness of what God's people were allowing. But what is interesting is when you go back into these histories and these histories get repeated is that the liberals rise as a reaction to the conservatives. So the Pharisees, Pharisees in the time of Christ believe that if they could get all of Israel to keep the Sabbath holy for one day, the Messiah would immediately come. So what did they have? They had all these laws, all these restrictions on how you keep the Sabbath. They were so strong on it because if they could get anybody to do this for one day, Messiah, and then Jesus came and did what? 
said all these things, new and strange things. They had to do away with him because the king could not come while Jesus was breaking the Sabbath. So that's all part of that dynamic. So as the reaction to conservative Phariseeisms, these Antoniniums rose up, the Gnostic sect rose up. So if you come down even into the time of the Reformation, you have Calvinism. Calvinism would be on this side, on the last generation theology side. There was a fellow called Jacob Arminius. He rose in direct counteraction as a reaction to the conservative side of Calvinism. And so you see this whole idea of no law even being fought at during the Reformation time. So usually from the post, for the most part, in the reaction to conservatives, that the pendulum swings and you get a liberal reaction. And this is what John was fighting. Well, no, you if you go under the sun. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, so if you go to the letter of John, and we think of the letters of John as being all about love. But he talks about the commandments as much as he does love. He doesn't separate love from the commandments. The third epistle of John, verse 9, I write unto the church of the di diatrophies who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, what he doeth, pranting against us with malicious words, and not content therewith neither doth himself receive the brethren and forbidding them that would and casteth them out of the church diatrophies and early gnostics anti-law and how does that affect him you can see it by the way he treats his brethren diatrosis means messenger of zeus he kept his pagan name and you can see the pagan philosophies creeping in. John doesn't fight Phariseeism. He, he's fighting Gnosticism. So you see Jesus kind of fights the Pharisees and John by the end of the Christian era. It's more about Gnostics. So you come down to this time period, 1856 to 18, 1989, two classes warring it out in Adventism. And what does last generation theology do? It takes an Ellen White quote, just one quote that says, when the character of Christ is perfectly represented in his people, then Jesus will come. And it takes that one quote, it's all about character perfection and reforming God's people, and it's taken out of contents. If you go on in and look, at that quote in context, it's actually talking about loving one another and having empathy, having set aside differences, having an upper room experience. So you have this war. What's God got to do? He has to start again. And that's 1989. He's got to clear the state. He's got to cleanse the sanctuary. Before he cleanses the sanctuary, it makes the plan of salvation clear again. He has to raise a host. If we look back at 1989, we can see the circumstances that allowed him to raise a host. The deadly wound of the papacy, the move from the old world to the new world, a kingdom rising and had, that had religious liberty beliefs. So everything is in place. I'd like to just to suggest that 1989 was the same. What circumstances came into being into 1989 that allowed God to raise a host? We know what is happening externally, but how does that affect internally? One of our characteristics of 1989 is the World Wide Web, information technology. What information does is, it puts the spirit of prophecy, all these quotes that are taken out of contents, it puts them into the hands of every individual. 
It takes some time to do, but now we have the capacity to read things and study for ourselves. Back in this history, 1863 to 1989, who do you have to rely on? You have to rely on the leaders. You have to buy the books. You have to spend quite a bit of money to those bookshelves. And then you're relying on the theologians commentate on them for you. God's word is being opened and being shared in a way it's never been able to do. We need to have access to the writings and we need to have a method of understanding. It's not just being to Google. It's not just being able to word search. You have to be able to word search properly. So just like the method that came into the history with, the, with William Miller, and also we know the distribution of Bibles, the Bible society, that the word of God got put into people's hands. So the ability that we have to get into an Ellen White CD-ROM, I can remember when my, this is um, Sister Terry talking. I can remember when my husband and I were new Adventists and we had those three volume sets, big volume sets. The binding was terrible. They fell apart. You had to carry them with you everywhere. And now we don't even have a CD ROM anymore. It's just a tiny little thing somewhere there in that thing called a computer. The information is there for us to study. If we use, if we use the right method. So when we come to our 9-11 and sin not, one of the parables is of the man that has cleaned, cleaned out his house. What have you got to do? You just got to leave your house empty, sweep the house out, and you got and you got and you got rid of the thorns. You got rid of the dust and the dirt out of the house. Now your house is empty. If you just leave it empty, what happens? Satan comes back with all his mates. So you have to be able to feel. It with the word of God. You have to be able to feel it with these truths. When we talk about the latter rain and the increase of knowledge, all God is all God is doing is feeling us, feeling us to overflow. If we went back to Daniel 8, in the beginning we see the ram and the he goat. The life of those two animals is transferred to the sanctuary. Satan's sanctuary needs cleansing just like God's sanctuary needs cleansing. So that light is transferred to the horn. When we become, is transferred to the horn, when we become Medes and Persians and Greeks. What were the Medes and Persians known for? Daniel 6. What character of the Medes and Persians do we get from Daniel 6? We get infall infallibility. Infallibility of what? Um, what did Darius make? What couldn't he change? He couldn't change the law. They were a people about the law. They were prudes of the ancient world, and you did not change them. And then you've got Greeks. What were the Greeks like? They had no inhibitions. It was not about the law. I'm not saying that the Greeks didn't have law but it certainly wasn't about law. It was about freedom. You didn't have to wear anything. You could play any game. You could do whatever you wanted. You could do whatever. Two very different kingdoms, but the life of both those kingdoms gets transferred to Rome. So Rome has both of those characteristics. It's interesting when we talk about liberals being a reaction to conservatives. Daniel 11, verse 2, and now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. What did the Medes and Persians do? They poked at Grisha. 
They had no business messing with Greece. Greece would mind their own business, live in their own desolate life, that, but the Medes and Persians poked them. And that's why Greece rises. That is what we see in the world today. Why are there protests everywhere? The protests are the liberal movement because they have been poked to do it. The pendulum swings, swings too far. That's the problem. Somewhere there's a balance, but in a reaction, when we see people, groups, fellowships, countries go off on a liberal tangent, we have to recognize that it is a response to, to conservatism. Neither side is right. So the life of the Medes and Persians and Greeks gets transferred to Rome. So in this time period, 126, we're getting trodden down by paganism and papalism. We're getting trodden down by liberal theology and conservative theology. God's people are, are in captive. They have, got, they have got to be able to come out of that captivity. God's got to raise a host and then he has to cleanse the sanctuary. God is not teaching us anything new. What he is doing is dusting off the jewels of William Miller, our understanding of the sanctuary that was given back. And they were getting more light and more understanding. If we live in this time period and we say, I want to understand righteousness by faith, do we go back to the 126? There are insects eating away at God's truth during this 126. What we have to do is come back and recognize the messenger of this time, who is the one that is going to be teaching us righteousness by faith, just like Christ did in his time and in his line. So Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. We have to get the message right. We must understand the message comes through us, through the prophets. We must understand the plan of salvation that is the work of the priest. The message is just biblical truth. The plan of salvation is how to cooperate with him in that plan of salvation. Our role is, it, is in that plan. People say, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you what." really doesn't matter what you believe. That is why part of this is just fixing up our understanding, correcting us, reproving us, and correcting us. Correcting, reproving, okay. We cannot do anything to atone for our sins, but we can cooperate with him in keeping our garments clean. That is well within our power to do. So we need to learn more about that and that is why we have rebaptism. Why do we have rebaptism? Because we realized we are in the same 9 11, 2014, and we didn't get our life in order. We either did not know it or we didn't understand, but once we realized we're entering into a spiritual kingdom and what God is requiring of us that is requiring us to keep our garments clean, then it's time to start again. That's why so many are entering the spiritual kingdom and getting rebaptized. Because if you say you have no sin, you are a liar. It's time to put that away. I think that's done. Yeah, that's it. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. That was really good. Thank you. Thank you for putting those together. Oh, you're welcome. Anybody comment? Thank you, Sister Tony. You're welcome. It's a very nice study, and uh, it's so good to remind ourselves, um, you know, this study because when, when presented by somebody else, it's uh, you can notice say, things that we, I mean, sometimes we miss things and then uh when somebody else presents it then you pick up things that you haven't realized before amen i'm glad you picked this study thank you
You're welcome. I, I liked it because there was a lot of quotes in it when I first, um, when she was first presented. I thought that was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So then nice. it, it led me to open up my Bible, you know, to put the commas and where to stop and where to go, you know, and then, you know, when then you learn more, you know. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. Uh-huh. Because even in the uh, spirit of probably she was doing Ellen White, they opened up my Ellen White to make sure it was the right, because some of the words, she didn't put all the words properly in, you know, it was like she could like take off the first word, but I just thought to put them all in. So it would, you know, so it was good for me. Yes, thank you, Sister Tony. Oh, thank you, Robert. Sorry about this morning. That's all right. All right. Thank you. Dave forgot to shut his uh, Zoom off last night. Who? David. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> so, I <started. laughs> so we had a good little meeting. Yeah. Well, the, 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 uh, they, they at least sent out the devotional so y'all can pick it up yeah. on your email. Sister Tony, right now, um, this, this uh, graph, okay, this is not the graph, but this graphics that's showing this uh, 12, two 1260s, 12 uh -huh. I, I missed the point. So there is this uh, 723 BC to, so the first 1260 from 723 to, what date was it? Uh, it should be down here. Um, for, what is it? For the first 1260? Yeah. It, it started, it wasn't, isn't it? Yeah, 723. Okay, well, one of them is 677, and the other one is, isn't it 742? For... 742 is when I yeah. did the prophecy, and then 19 years later is when Israel is taken captive. Oh, captive. Okay. So then it's then 46, then, uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. And then 46 years later is when Judah so, is then taken captive. Okay. Oh, that's why but I have the that, 19 and the 6, 46, okay. Is that your, did that, that, I don't know if that was the answer to your question. I think so, yeah. No, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, this, this two, uh, two 1260s, uh -huh. I know, I, I, I forgot, I, so I'm just trying to figure out. Oh, because you have the, you have the 2520, and if you have that on each side, it was a 1260. Uh-huh. And it switches at the papacy at 538. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that what you were looking for, the middle? No, no, yeah. So I'm, you know, I was just looking at this uh, pagan 1260. So it's a 723 BC, right? Right. So yes. 723 BC plus 12. Um, so it's negative 723 plus 1260. 538. 537, 38, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's the um, uh, Constantin's, right? Yeah. With the that's the Sunday laws. I mean, the, you know, yeah. Emperor Constantin. And yeah. then you have the papacy until 1798. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> funny, I, was, I forgot about that one. I mean, it was funny. I remembered. I, I thought that was a question you were asking, and I was sitting here thinking, what is that date? And it's like, yeah. you know, it's such an easy one. We should, it's like one of the basic ones that I, was I know, huh? finding myself asking myself the same question. <laughs> I know. I know. That. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing like having to have good reminders all the time to yeah, know, huh? keep our brains uh, saturated with what we need. <laughs> yeah, man, these are basics and we should, <laughs> we should keep doing <laughs> I know it is, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, this was a good thank session. you everyone yep so do you anybody have anything else they want to comment or question or are we close in prayer or sister christine do you have anything that you need to say want to say i would like to talk about the devotionals for monday and wednesday so um if, it, okay. if it's um not clear so uh, Sister Tony's going to take a sabbatical, and so there isn't going to be somebody doing uh, Wednesday um, showing up for Zoom. She's going to continue uh, 
uh, sending out the devotionals and the health message, but not being there for uh, Zoom Wednesday morning. So if there's anybody who wants to uh, step in that spot on, on Wednesday. Because I, also here's a thought. I mean, because I, I plan on continuing, like you said, to continue, keep doing the devotionals. But if someone just wants to, I'm going to send them out, but if someone, I will already do them and someone can just read it, you know, yeah. If, if, yeah. If, that, if that would be good for someone. Yeah, so that would be great if somebody would just um, want to show up at, at on Zoom at seven o'clock on Wednesday morning and do the devotional that uh, Sister uh, Tony sends out. And I will send it to them so they'll have the notes. Yeah. Yeah, and then also Monday mornings are open, so if anybody's interested in that day, also. So we're just putting it out there, um, you know. If anybody's uh, heart is moved to do that, and we're gonna we'll announce it on Friday and, and on Sabbath also. Also, okay. I'll do Wednesdays. Yeah. Nice. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'll have it all ready for you, Robert. You just uh, present it. All right. Cool. No problem. I'm there anyway, so I might as well do her. Exactly. I'm sorry I missed you. <laughs> and we're sorry we weren't clear about that in the email. Um, yeah, I saw that this morning. I'm, you know, I apologize to Sister Kathy. No, it yeah, it's all good. Um, I am pretty sure that God worked it out so yeah. Brother David and Brother Robert could uh, connect. I thought yeah. that was great. Yeah. <laughs> great. That's all I got. Okay, so who would like to pray for? Pray? I can pray. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for allowing us to gather together. Thank you for teaching us this valuable lesson. Uh, we, we, are um, we appreciate the fact that you're given us the time to repeat these presentations uh, since they appear to be so important for us to take heart. Uh, all of the presentations from Elder Tess and Elder Parmender and our, our dear sister Terry and our other brothers and sisters who have um, repeated these messages. Uh, we are so grateful that you're allowing us to go over it, over it again and again for rep repetition will help um, cement it into our minds and help, uh, help us to see all these things from different angles, from different perspectives and put all these pieces together. And so we are so grateful for the time that you have given us for this repetition. And we thank you so much for being here with us and we pray that you will continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit, um, give us wisdom and understanding and discernment and help us put these pieces together and help us to truly understand the message of equality and nationalism and homophobia that we may have the correct mindset of heaven as we go forward to help in the harvest of the Levites and the Nethanims. Dear Father, we our greatest wish, our greatest prayer, I mean, is that we would all be uh, ready to be accounted worthy uh, to stand before the Son of Man at his second coming, that we could be a part of your kingdom, and that all these valuable souls that are around us will be coming with us. And so we thank you, Father, for teaching us, for training us uh, for your purpose. And we pray that the things that we say, the things that we do, will do nothing but glorify you, showing your character, and that people will see you when they look at us, that they would see your character of kindness and gentleness and humbleness and be drawn to you. May you be glorified. And we, um, we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. Amen.